YAML ain't a markup language. That's the full form of YAML. And this is a highly polarized name. You either absolutely like it or you absolutely hate it. There is no in-between in this name. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, we are going to learn about YAML. YAML is such an interesting and very easy topic to learn. In fact, this just one video is more than enough to know almost everything about YAML and I'll point you in the documentation direction as well. This video is going to be suffice enough that whenever you see next time any YAML documentation, you will be fully comfortable there. This video is divided into two parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about the theory and why YAML is there and what's the problem that it's trying to solve. And the second half of the video, I'll take you onto the computer and we're going to write a very simple YAML. And in the last part, I'll walk you through in the documentation of the, vid of the YAML as well as we'll give you some of the YAML files so that even if you're not interested in that topic, just have a look on some of the YAML files and uh, have a little bit of practice. Okay, that's actually three parts. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started. First, very importantly, let's try to understand what YAML is and what is the problem that YAML is trying to solve. Now, YAML is a serialization language, but it doesn't explain much what actually it is trying to do or what problem it is trying to solve. For that, I have brought up two of my old phones, not newer ones, I still use them. One of them is Android and another one of them is iPhone. And I do remember the time in the earlier days when if I had to transfer any photo from my iPhone to Android, it was a nightmare. And eventually, some of the technologies came around. One of them was WhatsApp. Now through WhatsApp, you can transfer your photos from your iPhone to Android without worrying about anything. And there are a lot more services which even transfer your photos into all the high resolution that you really want. So what it has to do with the YAML? Now YAML serves almost the same purpose. When two of the technologies need to talk with each other, they need to agree on certain set of standards that this is how we're gonna transfer the data. For example, let's just say your backend is talking in a language Python, Django, and your front end is talking in a language JavaScript, React. They need to talk to each other to transfer the data and they have to agree on certain set of instructions and standards that this is how I'm going to send you the data. In the world of web and mobile, most of the time you're gonna see JSON is one of the language that does the same. Now you're gonna see the name XML quite a lot in this as well because XML, JSON, and YAML are the three major player in setting those standards and transferring data from one tech to another one. Okay, not only that, sometimes there are two servers on the back end for the same project. One server, let's just say Django and MySQL, they are handling the user authentication and registration part. Another one like Node.js and probably Mongo, they are handling analytics of the same project. They also need to talk to each other and they need to agree on certain set of instructions or certain standards that this is how we're gonna transfer the data because the language is different, the way how they are storing the data is absolutely different. In most of the cases, they agree that we are gonna handle the JSON and this is how we're gonna talk in the data. This is the process of serialization and you can feel free to use any other language in there uh, like XML, JSON or YAML. Now coming on to the YAML. Now out of these three serialization language, YAML is the most simplest of all. If you think that the Python code is simpler, multiply it 10 times onto the simplicity in the YAML. You're going to find that if you have a little bit interest in the DevOps sides or configuring or orchestration of the server, you are going to see an awful lot of YAML there. And since in the world of cloud, there are a lot of people who are not from the tech background or the programming background, they also get into the cloud domain. And in order to make sure that they don't feel too much of the stress in configuring the server or putting a server up and running with some configuration, YAML is a great tool of, for provisioning the servers. So whole story short, if you want to talk to the servers and if you are interested in DevOps or a little bit of the cloud, YAML is unavoidable. YAML is super easy to write, code, read, and a lot more things. But the whole story short, YAML is super easy and we're going to next target how to write YAML code. And of course, before we get worried about, are we gonna write some of the code for servers or we're gonna put up some things on the cloud? No, we are not gonna do that. We're gonna make simpler things. 
we're going to be writing a simple YAML configuration file for, let's just say, courses that we are going to design. This will help you to understand different aspects of YAML, different data types that YAML can accept, and a little bit more onto that. So this is going to be the simplest one. I'll link the code part as well in the description as well in case you want to take a look. But I highly recommend to first watch this entire video and then after that, just follow along or write code with me. So enough of the talking, now let's go on to my computer. Writing an Ansible file is super easy, so let's go ahead and do that. Now first, just open up any of your favorite code editor, whether it's VS Code, Sublime Text, or whatever. I'm gonna be using VS Code because I like it, like it a lot. Now first, go ahead and create a new file, and you can name your file as uh, any file name. It can be an extension of .yml or a simple yaml. Both of them are totally accepted in the world of yaml. Most of the time you're gonna see people write a complete YAML, just like in the world of HTML. So nothing too much to be discussed on that. First, of course, comments. So just go ahead and put up a slash and let's go ahead and let's, come on, let's write some uh, YAML. Now again, uh, it is just a personal recommendation. Please don't be that guy who puts and write comment like this. Always be a guy who writes comment like this. It's not gonna make any effect as all, well, but in the future, you are going to see some good practices if you put a space there. Generating auto-documentation actually is a really good thing if you put a space there. Again, just a side note, nothing to do with the YAML. Let's go ahead and write a YAML. So how does the YAML look? Uh, it's usually a key value pair, and that's all YAML it is. So let's go ahead and write an in-depth YAML. First of all, let's go ahead and say I'm writing a YAML for my courses, and in fact, one of the course here. I'm gonna go ahead and put up say that, hey, this is my course name, put up a colon, and then the key and the value. You get the idea. So let's just say the course for which I'm writing is my Django backend developer. So this is my course name. Of course, the course is going to have a version because eventually versions of the courses do change, their updates are there. So I'm gonna say that this is a version 1.5, internal versioning of the courses. And of course, the course is going to have a price as well. So price is going to be, let's just say 199. I hope you get my point here, why I'm doing this and why I'm writing this. The course name is actually a string. I have used a double course to reflect the string here. Although you are going to notice that this is totally allowed and this is still considered as a string. I really don't consider that as a good practice because if it is a string, it should be more friendlier. Just putting a double quote is not gonna do too much, but I personally like this version. You can use numbers in decimal format and in the simple simple numbers as well. There are ways I'm gonna show you that you can forcefully do that. I want this version number with B, like when interpreting it, it should be after, after decimal, there should be two points. So there, there are ways of doing it. I'll show you docs for that, but it's not really that much gonna be important for you. Okay, so our price is 199 and then we are going to have uh, is public. Is this course available for public? So I'm gonna put up a Boolean value, true. Yes, this course is there. And notice here, I'm not using camel casing. I'm rather preferring to use an underscore. That's a practice being done in the YAML industry or people who write YAML code in the DevOps world. So make sure you also take care of that as well. Now, one other thing which confuses a lot of people is actually the date format. So let's just say when this course got released out, the date format that is usually uh, preferred in the YAML world is like this. First, you write your year. After your year, you go ahead and put up your month name. So let's just say fourth month and then the day. This is the usual standard format. Yes, there are ways to change that, but uh, nobody changes that and it's not recommended. You can also go ahead and put up a time. So time has standard format. There is nothing too much to discuss on that part. And let's just say this course is going to have some of the pre-enrolled students. So I'm gonna say pre-enroll. So some people who have got into as a tester or an advanced uh, user of the course. So you can go ahead and say and put their names or you can just put up a null that, hey, there's nobody here. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do still on this one. Like for example, I can go ahead and say, hey, uh, this course is going to be part of a whole lot of courses. So you can go ahead and say, hey, uh, I do have a lot of courses and this course is one of the object of it. So you go ahead and put up an indentation there. YAML is a lot more inspired, you can say with Python. So you're gonna see a lot of indentation being done. So this is a common practice being done. 
And don't worry on this, that how this indentation, how it becomes an object. I do have a lot of video to cover yet. I'm gonna walk you through in that how these objects are treated in a minute. It will get all crystal clear. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about this object first. So let's just say this course is going to have a few tags. And you have noticed that tags are actually a kind of an array having multiple strings in that. So that's what exactly we'll be doing. So go ahead, put up and set an indentation, which is super important. I cannot put more stress on it. Indentation is everything in YAML. So you go ahead, put up a dash, and you can just say that, hey, this course is going to have a tag of Python. This is also a course of uh, web dev. So we're gonna say web dev, or web developer, yeah, whatever. And we're going to also say that since we are including MySQL or Postgres in this course, let's add that tag as well. This is the most common way of putting up an, uh, an array inside the YAML, but this is not the only way. Since YAML was designed to make sure that things become easier for people who are not coming from programming background, it offers same thing in multiple formats. So let me show you one more example here. So course is obviously going to have a TA. So course TA, and you obviously know that TA is going to be a list of name or an array of name. So you can use the above syntax that we have used just right now, or you can just go ahead and use your programming friendly syntax. So let's go ahead and put up a few names. So Anirudh is going to be one of the TA, Anurag is one of the going to be TA, and Rakesh is going to be another TA for this course. Now this thing and this thing are exactly the same. Depends on what background you're coming up from. Programmers usually prefer this one. People who are from non-programming background prefer this one as this is much more easier to read, but there is no difference in internal processing. They are exactly same. Now there is also one more thing. Uh, let me show you that uh, in a new file first. So you're going to see sometimes that most common syntax is an array. And inside the array, there are multiple objects inside this. So let me just go ahead and say this is an object. This is an object. So this is also a very common thing to be done that array sometimes consists that array, and this is going to be a string. And then we are going to have another string here and then another string. So these are two common things which are very common in orchestration, orchestration of a server, provisioning of a server, or doing any configuration. So both of them are very simple. We're gonna do something like this here. So let's just say we want to store TA details, details, and we want to put an array, and inside that array we want to put an object. So how are we gonna do that? So we're gonna go ahead and put up this, and now we are gonna say that this is going to be like this. So I'm gonna have a name, and the name is gonna be Anirudh. I'm storing details for these TA. Then I'm gonna go ahead and say email. Notice how the indentation I have used here. I haven't used a dash here to make it an object. And let's just say I'm storing an email. Again, this is a fictitious email, so don't send any email there. So ani at the rate lco.dev, and maybe I am storing a role as well. So this is going to be a role of, let's just say he is a content admin. There we go. And I want to store more objects in it. This, what I have done here is, uh, this is the very first object that I've stored in the array. And if I want to do more, I can just go ahead, remove the indentation, add a dash that this is my second object. And I can go ahead and say that, hey, name is gonna be, let's do one more. So Anurag, and uh, we are going to go ahead and put an email there. And his email is anu at the rate lco.dev, of course, fictitious again, and we are going to have a role. And he is going to be discussion admin. Okay, scroll a little bit, there we go. Okay, nice and easy, but again, as I told you, YAML offers you a lot of syntax for doing the exactly same thing. So let's add, so we have added here, first object, then the second object. Now let's add the third object in a different syntax. And a lot of programmers are gonna love this one. So what you can do is, you can just get a, directly go ahead and add an object and say that, hey, the name is going to be Rakesh here, and then email is going to be rack at the rate lco.dev, of course, fictitious again. And uh, let's go ahead and add a role and let's call it as DevOps. Okay, again, what's the difference between the first two and the third one? Absolutely nothing. They are just the same way but the writing style is different and you can choose any one of them, but you should be aware of both of them. Okay, just a couple of more things uh, before we go ahead and end this one, couple of more things. L course is also going to have some short description, obviously. 
So how we're gonna add the description. Now there are two things when you want to store any of the text element. The first one is this arrow. It looks weird, not this one, this one. It looks a little bit weird, but let me show you what it's gonna do. So let's just say I want to write some of the short description. I'm gonna say here is a short description for Django course, okay. So how this is gonna be stored internally or while processing of this YAML file, all of these spaces and new line characters will be removed. This is gonna be treated as just one line, like the role is being treated here as a string discussion admin. So all of the new lines and all these uh, formatting is gonna be uh, removed and this one is going to be stored as just one single line. But let's just say you don't want that, you want a long description and you want to store all the formatting. So this is going to be a long, description and you want to store all the formattings uh, like the new line characters and spacing and indentation whatever you have given then we use this pipe sign yes i know this is a or for programmers but uh, we use this pipe symbol and now we can just go ahead now we can store all indentation and related things so this one is going to be stored in process as a long string uh, which is keeping all the formatting and string. So you're gonna see this one a little bit less because this is less to use, but this one is like a whole lot being used there. Okay, uh, one more last thing that is important for you to know, and this is referencing the thing. Just like we have variables in programming and we refer that variable probably 100, 200 times in the code, that almost same syntax is given to us here as well. How do we do that? You can convert anything into a variable, whatever you have defined or newly you are defining. You just have to name that thing. For example, here is a price and I want to use it later on as a variable. I'm gonna go ahead and put an ampersand and the name of variable. You can call it as price or my price, whatever. It can be any variable name, this is just a name. It can be same as the key that you're using, but it's not compulsory. You can call it Superman if you like to. And we're gonna go up there. Now let's just say uh, you're processing this payment. So I'm gonna go ahead and say process underscore payment. And obviously you want to process the same payment, whatever the price you have mentioned. Later on, if you visit and change this price value, you want to process the exact same thing. You don't want to change it. So here you can just refer this by using an ampersand and can say price. So whatever the variable name you have defined up here, you can just go ahead and use that. And my bad, it's not ampersand, it's actually a asterisk. There we go, sorry. Okay, so just ampersand for declaring the name and asterisk for uh, referencing that. It's kind of a, you can say pointer or something, but it's not accurate. Uh, let's just call it as a reference here. Okay, uh, one last thing before we go ahead and move on. There is one very, very teeny tiny and very less used thing that notice here we have used these key value pairs up here and sometimes you want to refer that as a variable too. Although this is very lessly being used in the code world, but still, let's just say, this is moreover kind of an advanced thing. And we know that we can refer anything or make it available by using ampersand sign. So let's call it as advanced, okay. And now in this particular set, I want to define key value pair. So I'm gonna say my key, and this is my val, my val, okay. Now you want to, what you want to do, just like you have used your variables here, there is another advance here. And this time you want to have many values in it, many key values pairs. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's just say one and one is storing two and moreover things like that. But also you want to refer and say that whatever value is here in this key value pair, I want to insert in this key value set pairs as well. I know this is a little bit confusing. So what you can do is you can use two of these signs and then put up a colon and then refer this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I am referring again pointer and ADB. So there we go. So what this is gonna do is, this is a reference point and all the values which are there are gonna be just copied and being replaced up here as well. So that's pretty much easy one here as well. Okay, so quite a lot. And I told you, it's not really that much stuff to be worried about. It's really the simplest one. Now let me show you some of the uh, fun stuff uh, that you can do after watching this video. Is we have a lot of uh, YAML files available at our blog section. So go ahead and visit blog.learncodeonline.in. Click on the Ansible series. In case you want to learn Ansible full in depth, that's there, freely available. But just go ahead and click on any of this and there is a 
whole awful lot of YAML that we have written up here. That's gonna give you more idea of how YAML looks like, how it is useful in uh, provisioning a server and doing a whole lot more. So these are written absolutely professionally and a whole lot of people are using them already. So go ahead and uh, check them out, use them if you like. Also, if you need a little bit more, then I would highly recommend to go on to the docs.ansible.com, which is one of the standards of YAML syntax. I don't want you to read all of this because I've already covered a whole lot of it. But in case you want to read a little bit more, go ahead and read these gotchas. This is important, and especially if you're working on Windows system, uh, this might be really, really helpful to understand more on YAML and some of the caveats that YAML offers in the Windows system. And that's pretty much it. You're done, and you are now absolutely good to go with any kind of YAML file. That's great. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. There is a lot of blog on our blog section at Learn Code Online, and there's a lot of YAML there to read out and have a little bit play with that. This is going to be really, really helpful for you in probably the future, so make sure you don't skip this video. In case you have enjoyed this video, make sure you consider hitting the subscribe button. If not, no worries at all. We still can be friends. So go ahead and spread this video around, and we're gonna catch up definitely in the next video.